This episode of Believe is brought to you by Cryptid Coffee Co. Use promo code BELIEVE on checkout for 10% off their Angry Yowie Coffee Blend. Head over to cryptid.com.au to check them out. It was just the most massive thing I've ever seen. I, to tell you the honest truth, I thought, well, we're the only ones left on this planet. Something's happened. We've missed something here. The fear that went in me when I seen it was just, um, like, the feeling. I'd say it was fear, but I've never felt that feeling before in my entire life. It's a weird feeling. Like, you can't explain it when you don't know. You feel like you're being followed, but you don't know what it is. We had two to our right, another one in front of us, another one to the left, and another one just across the road, shaking the daylight out of the tree. All we get is a big red eye. I remember waking up and looking at the end of the bed, and there was a figure there, almost insect-like, and then I blacked out. Welcome to the show, everyone. My name is Cade Moyer, and you are listening to the Believe Paranormal and UFO Podcast. If you have had an encounter and would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. If you enjoy the podcast, be sure to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen and head on over to our website, believepod.com, and consider becoming a member to get bonus episodes and video content. Tonight, I'm joined by owner of Oz Paratech and half of the Frightfully Good duo, and welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Kate. Oh, it's great to be back here. Thanks for having me. It's always good to have you on. I get very excited when I get to talk to, to you and Renata, but tonight it's just you. It's just you. It's just me. I feel naked. I feel like I'm doing something <laughs> naughty. <laughs> Where, um, it, what are we doing? We're, we're doing like a, uh, a podcast affair. You know, it does feel a little bit, little bit off, but... I like it. <laughs> just, don't, just don't tell her whatever yeah. you do. Yeah, just keep it on the down low. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and it, it is it is great to have you back. Like, it, it seriously is. I um, I'm a I'm a really big fan of everything that that you do. Like, you you're one of the hardest working uh, people in the industry because you basically you're doing something like all the time, and you must be the yeah. most exhausted person in the world. Yeah, Renata and I are just absolutely wiped uh, most of the time, uh, but we are doing something we love. So, yeah, it's hard work. Yes, it's tiring, but it's also fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's really one of the the whole reasons I, I kind of wanted to chat to you tonight because, you know, you're you're kind of like a little bit of an inspiration to me because I see everything that, you know, you're out there, you're out there, you're doing things, you're hustling, and you're working hard doing the things that you love. And one of the things that you you do is like you actually kind of, uh, you know, you jump into a lot of documentaries and stuff like that. And this is a little bit of an exclusive, but I'm actually looking at putting a couple of documentaries together myself. Um, oh, yeah. So, um, Ton Mears and Attila Coldy, they've both been in my ear kind of telling me you need to get out there and, you know, do something. Do something about the well, podcast. Yeah, give it a crack. Yeah. Have a try. Exactly. So, um, because of them and just, you know, the amount of peer pressure that they put on me, I, I buckled. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm going to, I don't know what that looks like yet because I don't know where to start when it comes to, you know, exploring the paranormal and, you know, how do, how do I do that in a way that is done, I guess, right? So I, I kind of mm-hmm. don't look like a hack, um, you know, do it effectively and do it like not, not overly scientifically because I'm not that way inclined. You know, I, I would lean a little bit more on the fantastical side of things when it, when it comes to that. But I do like to, to have like something kind of tangible when it comes into that because i'm a really big uh i wouldn't say skeptic but i'm probably a skeptical believer is is how i kind of describe myself because it's so easy to get kind of caught up in the moment of things when you know stuff's going down in in the paranormal world the ufo world and, and and so on um and this is kind of where you come in because you do own australia's like largest store for like the weird and the wonderful when it comes to kind of ghost hunting equipment so because of that i wanted to get you on 
chat with you and like really pick your brain about, you know, how first you kind of got into that business. Because personally, I find that kind of fascinating because, you know, it's not just the an everyday business <laughs> to, to sell, like kind of that ghost hunting equipment. Um, and why why you kind of got into it? Like, you know, how, how that started, why you do it. And um, then give me like some tips, like what's the, what's the type of equipment that I uh, should be looking for or, or anything like that? Because I'm very green when it comes to, to this side of things. Um, no doubt I'm going to shit my pants when I'm out there kind of doing this type of investigation stuff. But it'll be really cool to, you know, have something to tell me, you know what, something is happening here. And it'll be just great to almost have that on a an unofficial record type of thing on be that video be that audio be you know whatever it is that you know is a is a recommendation by you so i guess the the, the floor is kind of open to you like why why did you start a business like that well i mean i was a paranormal investigator myself i've been doing this for 11 years officially now and uh i sort of realized it was difficult to get equipment and you had to buy it from overseas and um there was actually another guy that uh started uh selling the paranormal equipment here in australia and uh he sort of didn't have a real good business handle on stuff and it sort of went south and then I stepped in and I said how about I help you so I came in and uh, tried to help as well and then that sort of all went south and then my husband and I went to one of the paracons and my husband got talking to Sean Porter from Ghost Stop and he said to Sean oh would you like us to sell your equipment here in Australia and at this stage I didn't know he had even broached this with anyone and he organized this deal with Sean comes back to me and says oh we're going to be selling paranormal equipment and I've gone hang on a second I don't want to be stepping on toes here because there is somebody else that's selling equipment he said oh yeah but they're not selling that equipment they're not selling ghost stock and I went oh okay fair enough so um we started off selling the ghost stop gear and uh, approached the the old reseller that was selling stuff here and said, look, can we be a tier two underneath you? And um, we started doing that, but I won't go into too many issues, but there was a few problems. And uh, in the end, DAS uh, took us on as the tier one sellers. And that's how we ended up now with the largest store in Australia because uh, we got a very good working relationship with DAS and with Go Stop and we also stock Centex. Um, I tried so hard to get Bill Chapel. <laughs> I tried really hard, but um, Bill's vacillating in between retirement and um, wanting to keep going and then stopping and then goes again. But uh, I've, I can now call Bill friends. So I think I've won in that that. Um, instance there anyway so uh yeah but that's that's how we ended up being uh resellers of equipment australia yeah right so it's it's almost just kind of right place right time type of scenario there and all the pieces just kind of fell where they needed to fall yeah and it was my husband it's my husband that started it and now he's too busy with his full-time job so i think he always did it knowing that that is something I wanted to do. And I, I did I did do it well when I was helping the other guy. Um, and uh, he he wanted me to run it myself. So um, thank you, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you, dear. You know, I, 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 think, I think Roman's a bit of a genius because he's, he's found a way to keep you infinitely busy. So he's, he's just oh, like yes. gallivanting doing what he likes now. <laughs> he's out there drinking scotch right now. <laughs> sounds, sounds like he's having a terrible life, that's for sure. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's really cool. So, um, when it when it came to to that kind of that business, like that that would have been quite a an interesting one to bring up with with friends and and family and stuff like that. Kind of kind of saying, I'm going down this route to to sell things to find ghosts like that's, yeah. that's kind of that's kind of the equipment uh, i guess kind of the the conversation that goes behind that um now when when you did that was there like any kickback or or anything like that because i guess that's a that's a very very interesting business model well i'm an only child of an only child and um my my mother was an only child. My father doesn't have much family around him. So my mum had passed and it was only my dad that was left. And he just rolls his eyes at me and says, oh, the spooks, oh, the spooks. <laughs> but he, he didn't actually 
fight me on it. Um, my son keeps saying everything is dust. And my daughter sort of came out with us a couple of times and did some investigations, but got too spooked. So she gave up on that. But they could all see that it was my passion, a huge driven passion. And they all supported me in it. Yeah, that's so cool. And I think that's fantastic to to have your family members kind of, you know, support you in that way and like even come out and do investigations. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky that way. Lucky or blessed, I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, I'm taking it with both hands and saying, oh, thank you. Yeah, and, you know, this is probably like a, a business style or a lifestyle that a lot of people really dream of because you're you're kind of blending hobby and, and business together. So the, the reality is, like, you probably never really feel like you work a day in your life. No, but uh, even better still is I've managed to incorporate travel <laughs> when when it's not a pandemic. Um, with the frightfully good duo of Renata and I, we uh, we have our YouTube channel now, which is Anne and Renata Frightfully Good, and we are travelling around the world to haunted locations. And uh, our last trip was to England only in uh, April this year, and we did the naughty and nice road trip where we started in the little town of Shitterton and then we tried to get up to Twat but uh, we had to go on a ferry boat to get to that and Renata won't do ferry boats so we ended up in Muff um, <laughs> in Northern Ireland but we visited haunted locations all along the way as well as uh, meeting some of the, the people who love the True Hauntings podcast and the Anne and Renata brand the Frightfully Good brand um, we had an absolute ball that's cool that's so cool you know the the fact that you can do that and not have to worry about it. Not worry oh, that. It's only, it's only the editing you have to worry about. It's a nightmare. Editing, it's a, it's a creator's curse. And to be honest, <laughs> I it, it's, it's one thing that absolutely terrifies me about doing video because, um, man, the, I, can, I see the amount of work that, that goes into it. I, I, it. It's months. It's months of work depending yeah. on what you're doing. And... You're never happy with it at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, we were lucky for this trip because we had this wonderful, wonderful um, man. It's actually the husband of one of our um, Patreon supporters who came on board and said, look, I want to help you girls because I really believe in you and um, he wants to help us out. And I've gone, oh, yes, please. <laughs> but first off, he had to give us a crash course in filming. Oh, right. Um, yeah, we we had to because we've we've got our Sony uh, cameras and uh, we had to get microphones and um, then he wanted establishing shots and close ups and and long shots and we're going oh wow oh, this is terrifying <laughs> it really is a crash course that's uh, I think that's cool though because you know you you are very much in that whole audio realm because you know you you have the the True Hauntings podcast which is fantastic everyone needs to kind of. If you're not listening to it, uh, jump over, jump over to it and, you know, give it a listen because you, you two, you put so much bloody work into that and, uh, <laughs> it's always a thankless job. So, you know, I want to, I'll, I'll speak for like every one of your listeners and say, thanks for doing such a, a bang up job with it. But, um, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to warn people though, do not listen to it while you're driving because you may have an accident. Yeah. Yeah. The, they're a bloody crack up. It's the best. <laughs> I you end it. up laughing so hard that you've got tears streaming down your face and it's you can't see the road. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, Who ever would have thought that a, a podcast on hauntings would be that funny? <laughs> you know what? It's it but it is. Like the the thing is, like the the paranormal is like it is a little bit funny. Like there's there's funny things that happen, there's funny stories that come out of like almost tragic situations. Maybe that's the dark humor in me, but um, I, I recently did a, a live show um, for my podcast and someone called up telling me this to, to, to him. It was like this absolutely terrifying encounter and he had a lot of difficulty talking about it. But essentially he was really young and a ghost was trying to, he was in the loop and a ghost was like stomping on the floor and trying to open the door. You know, that's a super scary situation. But I guess in, in the hindsight of it all, you know, 20 years later after the, after the fact, able to have a laugh about it and you know kind of see that humorous side in it but that's how the the paranormal can just be just that little bit i think there there, there has to be a lighter side to it is what i'm trying yeah. to say 
Yeah. Oh, and my goal every episode is to make Renata lose it so that she wheezes and can't talk. <laughs> you know, that's fantastic. I, I used to do another podcast myself and um, there was always a plan. There was always like show notes. This is what we're doing. This is how it's going. And my goal was just to, to get that car into a ditch and it's a, it's a dumpster fire then. <laughs> <laughs> So I do want to pick your brain about a couple of pieces of qu- of equipment that I I would want to know like what's the what's the kind of go to for uh, an investigator's tool belt because I see things like K two meters and and things like that um, I see like little devices with antennas that kind of you know make sounds or, or things like that. Walk me through this because I am very green. I, I don't know a lot about it. What's the what would be those kind of go to things that would, you know, you would find essential for an investigation or, or for research? Well, see, it's all very different because you're you're originally talking about you're gonna make a documentary. So if if you're gonna make a documentary, you have to work with equipment that is more visual than it is uh, numbers on a screen. Uh, so audiences like to be entertained and they like to see something happening on the screen. So you you would be better off working with something that lights up or alarms uh, in no sorts of stir- circumstances. And that's where like the cat balls that light up and the REM pods that have the silver stick out of it and um, have the lights on it. Um, because in post, which is when you're um, you're editing and uh, getting it ready for the public to see, you um, if it's not making a noise, they actually will put a noise in. Um, so the, there's uh, an episode I did for a pilot where we had these cat balls that were flashing and it, they put a noise in like this so that people would be aware that something was happening. Yeah, right. Um, they, they did it for the K2 as well, the EMF meter. And then I had people ringing me up saying, I want the EMF meter that makes the noise. And I'm going, no. <laughs> <laughs> there is one, but it's it's um, actually uh, more like a sort of noise. <laughs> so it, it's something visual that the people that are, are watching the show can um, see for themselves and enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. One of the the pieces of equipment that I always found really fascinating, and I don't know where I saw it for the first time. It, it actually might have been um, one of Isaac Butterfield's first little ghost docos, where it was like a, um, I think it was an Xbox thing, like a camera on an Xbox, where yeah. it, it, I think it used lidar sensors in it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's the, key the SLSX cam. Is that the one? Maybe I don't know. It, the stick figures. Yeah, that's it. It shows the stick yeah. figures. That is really yes. fascinating. Like, what's what's the the essentially what's the go with that? Because is that All legit? Right. Uh, well, there's a couple of different versions of them. There's the one that Bill Tra- Chapel created, which is the SLSX cam structured light sensor, uh, and it's using the guts of an Xbox, and it's throwing out little points of light um, onto the uh, area in front of it. And I always like to describe it as, remember those things from the 1970s that had little pins on it and you put your hand onto it and it would move the pins and it would leave the impression of your hand there. Yeah. Well, that's what these lights are sort of doing is that it's picking up that there is a change in the depth of field and then it will map in, um, depending on what it's been programmed for, uh, it's looking for humanoid figures. Um, so uh, it will turn it into a stick figure uh, and people love that because they can see it. And I think Ghost Tube now has an app and that was created by Amy's Crypt, uh, where you can have that on your phone as well, which is a much cheaper version than the two thousand dollar SLS X cam. Wow, is that uh, how expensive it is? <laughs> yeah. By the time you pay your duties and get it shipped over here, I think it's one thousand two hundred and ninety nine American dollars. But oh wow. The, yeah, the dollar's not so great. So uh, when I got it it ended up costing me about two thousand dollars. Um, and people would say, oh, well, you can make it yourself. And you do. You see people walking around with tablets and they'll have the um, the 
the guts of the Xbox there and um, it's all wobbly and wibbly and um, they'll get very crude figures on it. What they don't realise is what Bill built into his is a lot more... Um, he has a lot more pinpoints of this IR light and he also has... Um, the uh, audio sensors in there and I'm just trying to remember temperature and EMF and it is uh, reading all of that stuff. So it's a a much more sophisticated bit of gear, but they can give you a lot of um, false readings. Yeah, right. Uh, Like you'll be in the pitch black and you'll be looking at this thing and there's a stick figure in front of you and you'll say, uh, can you wave at me like this? And lo and behold, that stick figure lifts its arm up and waves just like you did. If you've got a light source behind you that is even IR light, that means you're casting a shadow, which the uh, Xbox thing will pick up as a humanoid shape and then map it in as a stick figure and lo and behold, it copies what you do because you just did it. Yeah, and you know, that's that's the the thing because a lot of the, I would imagine there's like a fair bit of ghost hunting equipment that kind of relies on infrared light and and things like that, you know, like um, full spectrum cameras cameras where mm-hmm. oh, and you look at all the night vision cameras a good majority of those are they're using the the infrared kind of light spectrum to to see in the dark yeah a lot of people don't understand that you still need a light source with an ir camera uh, they, they think that it's a night vision camera therefore you can see in the dark with it but you still need your ir as a light source correct me if i'm wrong but there's like infrared torches that you can get right like you can kind of strap them onto to different things oh, there's to- all sorts of things and like people get upset if you call it infrared because it's actually near infrared because proper infrared is heat <laughs> oh, there's some people who are so pedantic about this stuff <laughs> absolutely if, if you're watching the video version of this uh, i just did the world's biggest eye roll about yeah that. there was it was a huge eye roll there <laughs> <laughs> It's um, it's it's really fascinating to me because I I could imagine like there's there's so many people who have an opinion on like what's right and what's wrong when it comes to to researching or you know um, documenting this type of thing and uh, you would probably be right at the front line for a lot of that because I would imagine you would have people say like, why do you sell this type of thing this thing is this thing's rubbish this thing's that yeah it, it, that all would, the time. Yeah, that, that would be really, really difficult. Especially the K2s. People hate them. Um, but uh, that's the first thing that people will go to. And a lot of people don't understand what they're being used for. They're not actually to detect ghosts. They are to detect changes of the environment around you. And in this particular case, it's EMF fields. I guess the the thing with those types of pieces of equipment is like they, they really do rely on what is going on around that vicinity i'm uh, that's yeah yeah, i know i know that's probably pretty dumb to say you know that's probably for any piece of equipment (laughs) but that type of thing is like i would imagine is highly influenced if you walk into a room that's got wi-fi or or cell phones or mobiles or anything like that in there and now a quick word from our sponsor also are you wanting more content why not become a believe plus member You'll get access to exclusive podcasts and episodes that aren't available to the public. Not only that, you'll also get our regular feed without any ads. Head to believepod.com forward slash plus to sign up today for just $5 a month. Or even a magnetic clip on your bag. We had really? one lady who kept putting it up to her bag going, there's something in my bag. There's a ghost in my bag. And we're going, no, you've got a magnet on your bag. And that's what's setting it off. <laughs> I would imagine it's almost a bit of a hindrance to to a lot of people trying to do these types of um, investigations or, or, you know, pieces of research with equipment like this because it, I would almost imagine it comes almost like a, a crux to, to what they're doing. Like, you go into a place, if this thing doesn't light up or doesn't go off, it's a failure. Like, there's nothing there. You didn't, you oh, didn't mate, get what you want. You suck as a ghost hunter if you, your gadgets don't go off. That's what we were told. We were actually... Um, when one of Isaac's uh, episodes that we did, and I think it was the one that was the private case, uh, we had one of the comments say, oh, you you ladies should be watching Ghost Adventures or Ghost Hunters <laughs> to get some tips on how to do this properly. Ah, yes, because that's a TV show that has about 150 people working <laughs> behind it and uh, is edited to within an inch of its life and you'd 
if you listen to those those shows, like you can hear the the Franken bites, which is do you know what a Franken bite is? Mm, I think I do, but tell me. So essentially, what a Franken bite is, it's when a, a like a piece of say audio or, or video is edited so much that the the talking doesn't sound proper because they're trying to get them to say something different. So, oh, right. yeah, so like a sentence would sound like it's being spoken very quickly or like in two different tones. And that's called a Frankenbite because it's essentially a Frankenstein creation. And you hear it all the time in those yeah. those ghost docos. Yeah. And let me guess, they they cut to them saying it and then halfway through the sentence, they cut to B-roll and you don't see them finish saying the sentence? Yeah, exactly. Like it happens yeah. all the time or it goes to a reaction shot that was filmed two hours later <laughs> or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So that's something I actually want to talk to you about is like, how do you find the, the reaction to your investigations that you do with Isaac? Because... You've done a fair few of them, and personally, I think they're done in a in a way that's like Isaac is a comedian. Like he has to have his angle to it because that's his brand. Um, but he's actually super respectful, in my opinion, about how he goes about it because he's not going in there, you know, being crude about anything or or anything like that. Um, yeah. And he's very open minded about it all. Like that would be quite refreshing i guess from from your behalf and i guess that's kind of why you continue to do those things yeah he's a giant chicken too (laughs) (laughs) Uh, look um renata met isaac a long time ago and did some work with him uh very early on and that's how that connection was made he came back like 10 years later and said now will you do this doco with us at maitland jail and uh i i was a little bit worried because I'd sort of seen the the headings of his uh, clips and things. I'm going, oh, I don't know if this is a good path for us. But, you know, we, we always just do anything people had asked us to do. We will put our hand – I like to call myself a camera whore. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll get in front of every, any camera because I love it. I just love it. I'm not looking at it going anywhere. Um, so we – we went with the flow and we let our humour run amok with him and he enjoyed it. But I was surprised how respectful he was. Um, and he was right into it. He wanted to know why, not just, um, oh, let's go find a demon or something like that. He was very sensible about everything we did. Uh, and he handed the reins to us and said, just run with it. You just tell me what to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's it's kind of like, here's the keys to the kingdom. You go, this is your show. I'll just be the guest to it. Yeah. So, of course, we would try to find the, the most traumatic things we could possibly do to him. <laughs> um, so, Maitland Joe, we found out he uh, hates Ouija boards with a passion. So, we blindfolded him and took him into the Satan cell at Maitland Jail. And we had it full of these babies I got from Kmart that are movement sensitive and also Ouija boards because I collect them. So I had a lot of Ouija boards and uh, we sat him down on the bed and then we all retreated from the room, closed the door and said, okay, you can take your blindfold off now, (laughs) the poor bastard. (laughs) And of course, as soon as he started moving, all the babies started moving, going, mama, mama. He was just freaked out. That's amazing. You've got to love stuff like that. And like, you've got to have fun in in situations like that, I think. Yeah. And I think his his fan base wanted to see him in uncomfortable positions as well. So um, I know that when we did the tunnel up in Queensland, um, I sent them in there by themselves with the night vision camera and they, they couldn't even get into the tunnel before they turned tail and ran back. Oh, wow. Uh, that, that was the one where I'd set up um, one of the dolls we bought on eBay. It was supposed to be a <laughs> demonic possessed doll. As you do. It was only 20 bucks. It was the bargain. Uh, and we had her halfway down the, uh, the 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 tunnel with cat balls and things all around her. And uh, in the end, we had to walk in with him. And it was supposed to be a tunnel where there was uh, um, uh, Satanists that were practicing down there, which I think is a load of bollocks. Uh, so we were trying to find things again that would be appropriate experiments to trigger activity so i said to him will you say the lord's prayer backwards <laughs> and he's like what the-? there was a few swear words that were dropped at that stage 
<laughs> and that's where we got called the agents of the Antichrist. Uh, <laughs> we, we do have a bit of fun with it, but um, we ended up playing it uh, uh, backwards on a recording because you can find anything on YouTube. I was surprised I found it on really? there. Really? There you go. And the cat balls lit up and um, yeah, the, the cat ball right next to Janet, the demonic doll went off and um, yeah, it was scary. That was a bit scary, but it was... I don't believe in that sort of stuff myself, so I felt safe, but they, they were freaked. I guess when you... And I guess this is this is really a classic trope of um, people who, you know, seem to have paranormal experiences happen to, to them um, is the word demon. You know, like, it, it was demonic. It was... And now my eyes are rolling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's like the... I don't I, like. I never, I never poo poo on anyone's like stories or encounters or anything like that because I'm, I'm never there. I wasn't there. I didn't. I'm not living through it. I didn't encounter what they encountered or anything like that. But I think it's such a, a Hollywood effect to, you know, you just look at the the Conjuring movies and things like that. That everything is just like demonic action, things like that. Demon cell. If you want to do well on YouTube uh, and get millions of views it's got to be demonic or people just aren't interested yeah and it, it's sad uh, and we are sticking to our truth and we do our stuff our our stuff on youtube is more about the journey and um we do some live investigations for people but if nothing happens nothing happens we're not going to do over dramatize and go oh, did you hear that that's a demonic sound and and carry on like that but that's what they're doing and they'll put clickbait headings in there like um demonic witch found in the woods and wait till you see what we saw and it's all bull dust the whole lot of it stuff like that i think really hurts the that whole genre more than mm -hmm. than anything because it, it builds up a stigma around you know what may be going on it probably causes a lot of hysteria in people who are easily influenced by that and you know are having you know, a potential paranormal experience happening in their house or at their job or, you know, just some some place in their in their life when it really could just be something that is so easily explained as, you know, electrical fields or, or something like that yeah. within the house. We even, because uh, Renata and I do a lot of private cases and she's a trained counsellor and uh, th there was one particular case we did where uh, they thought that... He, this gentleman was being attacked uh, during the night by a demonic entity and he was having scratches on him and there was all sorts of things going on. And I I went off with the, the mother and the daughter into another room and chatted to them while Renata chatted to the person that was being attacked and sort of looked into his history a little bit more. Um, we talked to people a lot. And if you watch Isaac's episode on that private case, you'll see that we talked to that lady involved a lot and there was a lot that was cut out. Uh, and it turned out that he had uh, at his work been um, uh, traumatised with uh, a break-in and somebody pointing a gun at him. And what was happening is he was having night terrors and he was reenacting what had happened to him and trying to run away and... Um, he his brain hadn't completely dis disconnected from his muscles, uh, so he he was flailing about, which is why he was ending up with scratches, and that's why he was huddled in the corner, cowering and crying because the poor man needed help. He needed help and counselling to be able to recover from that, and it it terrifies me sometimes that another team that is trained by watching the ghost hunting TV shows would go into there, or worse still, the Warrens, don't even get me started on the Warrens, um, they would go in there and claim that is demonic. And that would put even more terror into that family. And it's not. It's a man-made thing of a trauma that's happened in a person's life. You know, that, that really does raise a, a very important and, and kind of interesting topic when it comes to the, the world of paranormal, basically anything like paranormal UFOs, um, yeah, we encounter things like that is the the side of like mental illness that goes with that because it would be it would be so difficult to you know go into an, a potential investigation that you've been contracted to do only to find out that the the person that you've been contracted by is you know potentially requiring help on another level. 
Yeah, and um, this is where Renata's training helps. And I also did a mental health first aid certificate, which I think is another very valuable thing people should do. And you you train to recognise the signs. Um, and once again, it's just sitting down and talking to people, let them asking an open ended question and letting their their conversation pour forth. And many times it is grief uh, or trauma yeah. uh, or uh, misfiring in the brain uh, or chemicals out of balance in the brain. And we have to say that they need to find someone that they can talk to and sort through this. And we're not all often give them little tasks that they've got to do, but some of them, they find that they are special because they think they've got an attachment or they think there's a ghost in the house and they don't actually want the advice on how to solve it because being special is far more important and they will dismiss you and they will go and find another team until they find someone that will confirm their bias confirm their belief and it's it's it, it really distresses me it's dangerous that's what that is because there there's an absolute enabler complex complex going on there because you see it online and I, I love social media for for certain things and i hate social media for so much more um and one of the things i, I really hate is like just how enabled someone can be for something that is literally almost nothing and um, you, you see it all the time in, in paranormal groups. Like, <laughs> I'm going to raise a, a topic that you probably love slash hate, and like that's the the topic of like orbs and and stuff like that. <laughs> I must be is, psychic. Did you yeah. see? I said that word before you said it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and then that's the thing. Like, orbs are probably one of the most explainable types of phenomenon, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, that can happen. Most people have their flashlights on when, or the or the camera flash when they take a picture at night, and uh, you just look around at any room. It would be a, a smorgasbord of of dust and mites and things like that throughout the air. Yeah, we we did a true hauntings episode on a jail in Ireland, and um, I, I found a report from somebody who had done a ghost hunt on there, and I I read it out as part of the soundscape, and we had I had a lot of trouble getting through that soundscape because I just cracked up laughing continuously, but they were talking about um, there was an orb infestation. I'm going, it's I'm gonna I'm not gonna swear, but it's a freaking three hundred year old building. Do you reckon there's orb <laughs> infestation in there? Come on. <laughs> freaking dust. It's great. I um I had a, a friend of mine who has another podcast. Um he it was it was snowing where he lives and he took a picture outside his windscreen and posted it to a group and he says oh my god look at this and everyone just went gangbusters saying oh look at all those orbs you must be driving through a cemetery or some 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 crap like that and yeah. he kind of just came back and said no this is this is just you know snow melting on my i bet screen. they argued they did I bet they argued. And, and, and they did and that's the crazy thing about it it's people are just too far down some rabbit holes to to be helped and i that's just so I, I, I don't. I don't want to sound like really negative, but it's just terrible for the whole. That not not that you know the paranormal is an industry, but it doesn't make us look good. Yeah, exactly. Like it, <laughs> there's there's certain and things, we all get tarred with the same brush. That's it. That's it. Because it it only takes a few bad bad eggs for yeah. for the whole bunch to kind of be painted in that, and that goes for for everything that's out there. That's that's paranormal. That's UFOs, especially UFOs, and especially people who have Yowie encounters, because mm -hmm. people there's a massive stigma around all of those things, and no more, none more than than Yowies, in my opinion. Well, I haven't seen one yet, so. I'm too lazy to walk that far into the bush to try and find one. You and me both. You and me both. It's, <laughs> I, I have a lot of close friends who, uh, who you know, would would do it quite um, religiously. And, uh, oh, Attila. Attila's in there yeah, all the time. Yeah. It's like, mate, I'll, I'll see you in three weeks when you find your way out of that dense-ass bush. <laughs> so what is it about the... The world of the paranormal that like kind of keeps you going back to to one have a, a business related around it um but not only that to to offer it in a 
in a professional kind of um, establishment that you do, where you do the 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 one on one, I guess. I don't know how you would, you would, what do you call that? Like a treatment, uh, an investigation? Uh, yeah, uh, a, a private client or a, a private investigation. Um, it's normally just a chat is what we do. Just a chat. Yeah. We'll come and have a talk to you about it. But yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question after all that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm actually going to derail my question. I'll come back to it. Okay. One thing, and I, I know about you, but I get, absolutely smash for this is uh monetizing the paranormal oh isn't that wonderful yes how dare you make money from the dead well funeral directors do it (laughs) so (laughs) (laughs) look i have i've called myself now a paranormal investigator educator um there was another one as well and then i finished off with entertainer uh, I, I feel that I do all those things and I will change my hat depending on what it is that I'm doing. And I know that when I do Maitland Jail or our ghost hunting tours, that this is paranormal entertainment. And we will run something for people and give them the best shot of having a paranormal experience and uh try to educate them along the way but they're there for a good time we never fake anything but it it is a form of entertainment and i will you know put on the whole voice and the character and and do all that sort of stuff uh but i hope that i'm educating on the on the way and when we do our tarot thursdays that's definitely entertainment because i do readings and i tell people i can't read for shit (laughs) and i make stuff up and they still love it um so making money well Somebody's got to do it. Uh, Somebody's got to ship that equipment into Australia. And why not make some money? Why? Why is it that? And I I think a lot of this comes back to the Warrens who used to uh, say that they don't charge for their paranormal investigations. But what that people didn't realise, and we've done a lot of research on this through True Hauntings, is that they charged travel fees. Mm. So they would uh, have all their expenses covered, but then they would take these um, haunted items and put them into a museum where they would make money. They would broker authors and movie deals from the stories that they were creating and coming up with where they would make money. And they would have put their names on books where they would make money. So they were making a shit ton of money from the paranormal, but they've got these halos over their head, which they don't really, doesn't belong to them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that's one thing that it kind of gets my my back up a little bit because um, a a lot of people love to consume content Mm -hmm. without actually realising where it comes from. Yeah. And it takes a lot of time a lot of effort and a lot of investment to to be able to do the things that you know people like you and I do where this stuff doesn't just happen out of the just the ether you know it, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of work a lot of time away from your family from my family from from doing other things that we could be doing and i i think it's great that people love listening to those types of things but it's yeah it's a it's a double-edged sword when people come back and say oh you shouldn't be making money off it why why are you doing that well i just say to them well don't watch us go elsewhere yeah you don't i'm not forcing you to be here i'm not forcing you to buy stuff you can go do whatever your heart desires and i support you in that decision but don't stand there and judge me when you're not standing in my shoes yeah definitely and the thing is everything is still there for free you don't have to pay yeah we do lots of stuff that's free for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I have to ask you, our time's nearly running out. One oh, really? Pe- I know. Time just bloody flies when you're, when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> full spectrum cameras, yeah. are they worth it? Who knows? This is the problem with a lot of the paranormal <laughs> equipment is that there is no definitive yes, no, this is what works. This is going to get you spirit communication, um, the spirit boxes and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
you know, it's all hit and miss. You can never get a reliable result, which is what the skeptics keep banging on about because we can't get reliable results. It's all um, spontaneous sort of stuff. Uh, my advice is use them, try them, see how you go. And that's that's all you can really do. I mean, it's great for recording stuff anyway. So if there is any phenomena that's happening around you, at least you've got something on film, you can use them in the dark. Um, obviously, you can't use the ultraviolet part of that spectrum because you'd have to put the ultraviolet light on to be able to pick up that spectrum. And um, uh, that may just crazy. raise a whole lot of other questions that you don't <laughs> want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I, I just use night vision cameras because we work a lot in the dark. Um, I don't personally use full spectrum. Renata loves her full spectrum camera, but that's because she gets such amazing, beautiful photos and she is a photographer. So ah. that's why she uses it. There you go. It does have a, uh, a real world purpose too, which I think is cool. But before I let you go, where can people find you? Well, the equipment for Ozparatech is ozparatech.com. That's pretty easy. And we've got a Facebook page. Uh, but most, most of my work these days is with the Frightfully Good world with Renata. And you can find us on Anne and Renata Frightfully Good on Facebook. Uh, on YouTube, we've got we've actually got some videos on um, tips and tricks for the paranormal. And that's all free. Uh, and that's on our YouTube channel, Anne and Renata Frightfully Good. And we're on TikTok. um what else do we do on true hauntings podcast we're on sunday nights we do spooky sundays radio show on newcastle live radio which is actually on an app and on the website you listen between 8 and 10 p.m on sunday evening sydney time and it's very good that has been made into a podcast oh has it really it has oh that's super cool and they're smashing out the numbers on that they um had us up online for um, three months and we had close to 11,000 downloads. So that was pretty good. <laughs> that's not bad. That's not bad for a community radio station, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, so um, we're out there. We're, we're working it really hard. We've got a psychic development uh, workshop class that's starting soon. Renata's running that because I'm a psychic brick. Uh, but I will be pressing the buttons for it because I'm good at pressing buttons. Yeah, absolutely. And what I'll do is I'm actually going to – I'll leave links to everything that you do because – the, the list is huge. It's 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 too long for people to remember by heart. So uh, just check the show notes and I'll have links to everything that Anne and Renata do. But Anne, thank you so much for coming on tonight. You've uh, you've been a wealth of knowledge and uh, a good sounding board to, to vent some stuff as well. Oh, look, thanks for having me. And I hope that I've um, given some food for thought, really, for some people and maybe helped them along their journey. And I hope you get your documentary happening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Believe Paranormal in UFO podcast. If you have had an encounter and you would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. Finally, don't forget to follow us on all our social media outlets and be sure to join our Discord server to talk to other listeners of the show. You'll find all these links in our show notes. Thank you.